repeat some of the things that have been said already, but I have lots of pictures. So, and I have some hands-on things so that when we have the break after this, then you can come up and touch them and you know see what they look like. And then after the break, um, we're going to have a panel discussion where we'll have some laryngectomies um, using various communication methods. And so you can ask questions and we can have a dialogue, okay? So um, the talk that I'm gonna do, oh, and I'll tell you, I'm a speech language pathologist from the Tri-Cities. And um, I had a private practice for 24 years. And then um, HMOs came and stuff like that. So I um, quit that and went into the schools and had my summers off for the first time since I was 16 years old. And, um, and now I'm retired, but not from laryngectomy. Um, I started with our local laryngectomy group in 1978. And um, we are the oldest surviving laryngectomy support group in the state of Washington since 1969. And so um, I feel it's really important for there to be support for laryngectomies and you as first responders are very vital to our patients and um, we have had lots of um, horror stories uh, about people trying to get you know, emergency medical services. So we've been trying to get a program like this together for like 20 some years. And with Ed Chapman, who is now our club president, and me, um, we got this together with these fine folks in Spokane. So anyway, on with the show. OK, um, I have to disclaim, because I have a lot of pictures in here that came from ATO, which is a, a medical supply company for laryngectomies. And I had to let, them, you know, let you know that um, all statements made in this presentation reflect exclusively the opinions of the speaker and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of ATOS Medical. And the images were provided by ATOS Medical, which is out of Sweden. Okay, so um, we're looking at, okay, when the laryngectomy is in distress, there's an index of suspicion. Um, these patients would typically have normal lives. Um, I'm gonna show you pictures. You wouldn't even know that some of these people had a laryngectomy. Um, they just look you know, like anybody else. Um, orange is their alert color. Um, Brian mentioned some other colors, but um, I think some of those are older. I don't know, but the ones I've seen are all orange. And um, they may appear to have aphasia on an initial, initial assessment. Um, I had one of my members of my club who had a mild stroke. Went to the hospital. They're trying to put oxygen on his um, mouth and nose, and he's pushing it down. And they thought he was being combative because, you know, sometimes when you have a stroke, you are combative if it gets that part of your brain. And he was just trying to tell them, I need the oxygen down lower on my stoma. And so his family called me and said, you know, can you come here and tell them, you know, where he needs the oxygen? Because they weren't listening to them. And so I had to do a, a mini in service right then and, and let them know where to put the oxygen. So, I am so proud of all of you for coming because we need this help in the field. And, um, and then you should look for communication tools, which Brian did a great job talking to you about. And something might just not seem right, like what um, Dr. Mitchell said, you know, somebody had a stoma, a, a, pl a mucus plug, and he couldn't breathe, and you know, everything else seemed fine, and that's why they did the CAT scan and the x-ray and all these blood tests and all that stuff, because it looks normal but he's not, and uh, so that, that's important. So when you're identifying a laryngectomized individual, they might have that, oh, oops, oh, sorry, I just like, oh, ah. see, and you're okay. So they might have um, the ID bracelet. Um, it will say neck breather on the front, and then on the back, it'll tell what other conditions they have. Or they might have the um, necklace, which on the front just has a medical alert symbol, which you look for. On the back, it starts with the next reader and then lists all the other things that they have. And I have one here, which I'll let you guys look at later. Um, I came across on the internet the other day a company that makes fancy IV bracelets. And um, they come with beads and, you know, uh, macrame and, you know, all different kinds of decorative jewelry, but it does have a medical alert symbol on the center. So, you know, just be looking for jewelry sometimes. 
Um, to identify an allergic mice individual, you can either look for some kind of medical alert ID or what um, somebody came up with, I think his name was Frank, um, Dean Rosecrans, and I don't know where he's from, but they came up with this idea for in case of emergency ice in the phones, and everybody's got a phone now. So um, if there isn't anybody around this individual in distress, you can look on their phone and you find ice on their phone and it's gonna list maybe one to four people um, that you could contact to find out more information about that person. So that's something different that um, no one else had talked about, but if there's a phone in their pocket or in your site, um, you can look for that if you don't have any other information. Um, so you're going to look for an orange sticker in the rear of the car. Well, you saw that from Brian. I have one in here somewhere. Um, they have, well, he had the one for the pocket. Hang on, I have tons of stuff here. My bag trips. Okay, I don't know where it is. Oh, wait. Here it is. Okay, so oh, oh well. Anyway, so they have the cards that you can put in the pocket, but then they have some that are decals that you can put in the back of your car, in the back window, and so um, it's used for two different reasons. One would be if you were stopped by a police officer and you used an electrolarynx and you had it sitting on the side of you in the car and the police officer's coming this way to come to you and he sees you reach for something, he might think you're reaching for a gun. But if you have this sticker in the back of the window, it says that you're a neck breather and that you would probably have a device that you'd be talking with. Um, the TEP, the tracheoesophageal puncture, came about, it started in like 1980, but it's become more popular now, so in the beginning, <clears throat> Most people used electrolarynx or esophageal speech, so a lot of people would have an electrolarynx in the car. <clears throat> and you can look for you know, the medical alert ID bracelets and the necklaces, or look for alternate forms of communication, which we already touched on. Um, the stoma coverings, we touched a little bit about that. Oh, hang on, I go back. Um, so here's a cloth stoma cover. This is a big one. But if you have this and then you had a button-up shirt, it just looks like, you know, like a t-shirt underneath. It's made out of t-shirt material um, and attaches with Velcro in the back. Or for ladies, um, these are crocheted. And they just hook around like that. So, and then um, there's a woman over there who has one. And um, she has it on the outside, but it could be on the inside. And so, you know, it's just like, Another piece of clothing underneath. And then it might be um, a foam filter. Oh wait, hang on. Oh, I have one more. Um, they had these at one of our meetings. This is, anyway, it would just be like a scarf. A lot of women wear scarves now. I can't remember how this works. Oh, there's a little, there's a hole. Anyway, but it would just be a little scarf covering the stone area, you know, and actually, and um, well, there's different foam filters. Oh, here. Okay. So they showed you those square ones. I've got some that are um, flesh colored, and they're just very tiny. And so um, they just uh, have double sticky tape, and they just go right over the stoma to provide that moisture and that filtering that they no longer have before they breathe through their nose and the nose hairs would filter and warm the air and then it would go uh, down into your lungs and so you'd have warm air. But when you just have a stoma, uh, that's cold air going right in there. So if you have one of these there, that's going to um, warm it up before it goes down into your lungs. And then in the summertime when it's hot and dry, you can spray it to add more moisture when you're breathing in. So, they come in different sizes, different colors. Here are some bigger ones that are, um, there's a double, so it's like that. Um, double sticky, they can come in the white, they can come in the dark um, flesh color. And um, then they might have a 
TEP prosthesis with that white tab which was going around. But if they have the kind that the doctor puts in, they cut that tab off. And so all it is is a little white circle, a little tiny, tiny donut inside their stoma. So, okay, one of the things, we were talking about the HME filter. Oh, wait, I don't have to do that. I forgot about this thing. Okay, so this is what it looks like when it's outside of the person. Um, here's the housing, and here's the, um, the stoma cover that you, the HME, heat moisture exchanger, that you change every day. And here's Ed, who I don't know if he's here right now. Um, he's wearing it, and he has a plastic housing around it which kind of, it's clear, so you don't really see that. You just see this button here. And he has a TEP. So he would push that button, and it will occlude the tracheostoma, and then his lung air comes out through his mouth, and he can talk. And now I have, um, okay, so it's kind of, I tried to make this really big. There's his. He has an indwelling. So there's no tab. But you, if you looked in the stoma with your flashlight, you're going to see this little thing here. Do not take that out at first. Because if you do, it's just a hole and it will close up within a couple hours. And that happened to one of our guests. Uh, he came on Saturday, he decided to come early. And um, it came out. And he went to the hospital, and by the time he got there, it had closed up. And so if that happens, they have to wait about six weeks for the tissue to heal before they repuncture. So if they don't cause any other trauma to that area, which could, uh, if they puncture too soon, it could cause it to spread, and then the prosthesis won't fit in properly, and then they'll get leakage, and then they have the trouble or the possibility of aspiration. So anyway, it's really little inside the stoma. Um, here's a picture. Of, you, know, you couldn't see that very well, but anyway, there are so many different kinds of stoma covering. Um, those are cloth there. Those, those are foam there, different colors. And then we talked about the different um, electrolaryngeal devices. The person might be talking with an electrolarynx. He might have the oral adapter if he's new to having a laryngectomy. If they're too sore or um, they have too much scar tissue, they might have to use this kind of a, an intraoral adapter um, to, to get that voice source into their mouth. Um, there are all different brands. I, I have them in boxes, but I'll take them out for the break so you guys can look at them. But um, they come in all different colors, um, different sounds. They all have a vibrating source, but like you heard with Bryant, some of them um, sound squeakier than others. Some are stronger. Some are more robotic. Um, there is a little tool to um, change the pitch. Um, I have one that I got donated from a female laryngectomy, and so it's made a high pitch. And then you can make it really deep too. So. Okay, um, sometimes, and I talked about this um, earlier, they might have a Larry 2. This Larry 2, he's a laryngectomy, but he has a Larry 2, and I do have one here. Um, we do have one woman here from the Tri-Cities at the, um, for the laryngectomy conference, and this is what she has. She has, I don't know how to take it out, but, um, she has a Larry 2, so, it keeps the opening of her stoma at the right size, and um, it's more comfortable for her to have it going down into the trachea. And then she has this little metal frame with um, cloth, and then it, it would fit in around her neck. So you might see somebody like this, well, with this inside, but um, they're a laryngectomy, and they just have a larry too. And may or may not have a TPP. <laughs> so it's much more complicated now than it used to be. Uh, when I first started, you just had a laryngectomy, and you talked to an electrolaries, or you talked to esophageal, or you wrote on a pad of paper. And now with the TPP, they have so many different varieties. There's Sometimes it's more complicated um, surgeries, and 
you know, the anatomy is so different that um, you you can't you can't um, knock out a Larry two. But then some people. Um, Okay, so there, there's a, a picture of uh, Larry Tube in place with a, an HME in place. And then there's the TEP without um, any covering. And that's an indwelling that a doctor puts in and a doctor has to take out. The ones that have the tab, the patient can take out as often as he needs to clean it. Oh, and um, these are what they look like. Uh, this one is a Larry button, and it just keeps the opening. But then some people need to have the two. Anyway, okay. And then here are different people with laryngectomies. Some might have a stoma cover, and you can take that off. Some might have an HIV filter, you can take that off. Some have a base plate. You don't need to take it off. You can still get your tube in to do your uh, bagging. Uh, you don't have to take that off. Okay, here's a whole bunch of people. Oh, one of them's in this room. <laughs> yeah. um, right there. And she's got a, a cloth cover and she's got jewelry on it. This man has a beard. So that might, you might not even think he's a laryngectomy, but he does have a stoma cover. Okay, he has one of those bibs. Um, this guy has an ascot, but he's a laryngectomy. He has an ascot. He has a foam filter. That's the flesh one, so he wants it to just kind of blend in with his skin. Um, this guy has uh, a TEP with um, HME filter. It's only showing a little bit of it right there. He has a, a stoma filter that is um, foam. She has jewelry. We have one laryngectomy that comes to the IAL conventions, and she designs jewelry for women, and it just looks like a piece of a, a really pretty necklace. And um, but that's a stoma cover. Hers is crochet, and it's got you know like little lacy edges on it and stuff. And you might not know that's a stoma cover. And then this man has a different HME that I don't have a, an example of, you know, a, a hands-on one. Um, but that's a large HME. Okay, so what you cannot take off, you cannot take off a prosthesis, whether it has a tab or not. Just don't take it out because the hole will close off. You can take off. Yes. So we're going to skip that. Um, 
You know, we've taken a whole paradigm shift with um, our ALS, our CPR, everything, and we're going to bring this right down to the BLS level as well. Make sure you do not apply oxygen to the mouth and nose on a laryngectomy patient. It's not going to help them, and they've really done an amazing job here today driving that home for us. They are all of these neck breathers. So just um, look for signs and symptoms of, of, the, of the scene, not just of the patient. When we walk into scenes, we can tell when we walk into a scene what's, that there's something different. There's going to be different ways of communicating. Um, pay attention to your patient. Sometimes at 3 o'clock in the morning, we're not the best at really paying attention to what the patient's trying to tell us. And just kind of pay attention if the patient's motioning towards their throat or is not able to communicate, look, at, look for other ways that they might communicate with us. Did you have a question for me? Yeah, I was wondering, what's support? Basic life support. Sorry, we have BLS basic life support and then advanced life support. So, um, so just kind of really do a good scene size up on these uh, individuals, and that will take a lot of the guesswork out of whether you have an obligate neck breather. The BVM, as Brenda already discussed, we can use a BVM, preferably a pediatric mask would be the best, and even the pediatric mask tip sideways to ventilate these patients. Um, uh, let's see, be cautious of debris and fluid actually entering that stoma. That's one of the probably the most dangerous things we can do is actually get anything near the stoma if they're unresponsive and have them lying on the back or in any kind of trauma situation where we're taking care of these patients. Probably our biggest concern is maybe not seeing these patients in a respiratory situation, but seeing these patients in everything else that they could possibly come in, involved with where they're unresponsive from other reasons. Um, traumatic situations we need to be paying attention to um, and really protect that airway. Let's talk a little bit about ALS procedures. They already told us not to take out that TEP and um, to really protect that area. If for some reason the TEP comes out, and I, and I realize how important that is, whether we accidentally take it out or it gets dislodged um, and it has to be removed, Obviously, we can stick an ET tube in there and protect that airway for them until we get them to the hospital. Our primary concern at that point, if we have a patient that needs advanced life support skills, is, is protecting and saving their life to get them to the hospital, as it is with any patient that we see in the field. If we have to innovate these patients for some other reason besides just their uh, laryngectomy, uh, we, we don't necessarily need to RSI these patients. Think about it, they don't have a gag reflex. So your sex and your back, we don't really need to use. Maybe a little light conscious sedation, make it a little easier to put that tube down because we don't have to sink that tube as far. So we're gonna have a lot of tubes sticking out that we don't want them resting around with or we don't want any extra movement with. So maybe a little light sedation, make them a little more comfortable to protect our own airway. Suctioning these patients. Well, when we suction these patients, this is probably the biggest um, airway problem that we'll have is the secretions that build up, as we've already heard with Dr. Mitchell and, and Susan. When we suction them, we can have everything from really thick secretions to thin, um, thin, very easy to remove secretions. We want to make sure that we get the secretions out before we start to ventilate them again if we're having to ventilate them. And uh, we can do that by using just a soft tip suction device going into until we um, actually get to the corona and then back out about two, just a, like just a little bit, just like about two centimeters. Um, and then you want to actually suction in a circular, just roll to break the suction back and forth between your fingers, and that's the most effective way to suction on the way out. If it's really thick secretions, we might actually have to use a little uh, sterile water to actually flush out the suction between suctioning attempts. Uh, let's see. Really the best ALS procedures for these patients are going to be ALS procedures, protecting that airway, transporting them, and getting them advanced uh, definitive care. IV, I know, is going to treat them all the same way. They're going to look at the meds, their allergies. Everything else is the same. It's just their obligate neck breathers. Yeah. Yeah. Two things that pop into my head. Yeah. Nebulizing medication. And also, if all the rest, we're going to get something EPP. Everything the same. Everything's the same. Yep. We don't have any worry about things coming back up. 
Well, not any more than we. We're not going to be real tight there, I don't think. But our normal number eight ETP looks to me like that. So those are bigger than that. So. Oh, what do you I, think, think? I think number eight would be pretty big. Yeah, it'd be pretty big. And actually, it's the trachea. Once you get in that, in there, and you inflate your cup, the trachea is still the same. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, actually, it, it's going to be a lot easier, Todd. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. It really is going to be a lot easier than like the drugs into the. Okay. So um, I've got to tell you, I'd rather see it go IO though. Yeah, I mean, it's just much more efficient. So if we could drop an IO, that would be a better way to do that. So, anybody else have any questions about that? Okay. In an emergency, uh, communication is always a challenge with learn jet communication. That challenge can be exponentially greater. Um, be aware of the patient's condition and willing to assist them with communication needs. One of, I guess I did make it into this. One of the things that these patients have that we need to be conscious of is um, they have a very high index of anxiety. And none of the other speakers really address this. But as they go through this process, we are going to come across a lot of different uh, emotional needs that we may have to address. Remember the patient's thyroid has been taken out, so that's going to add to different hormonal imbalances that we're going to see with these patients. Um, they're, they're addressing a whole different change of life and a different lifestyle that they have not had before. And early on in this transition, we may see this with these patients. So kind of um, be really cautious of this and be, this is where the human side of, of us needs to come out, even in the middle of the night, and we really need to have, be good patient advocates for these guys and pay attention to their needs. So now, do you have any questions?